So we're here at the uh, National Air and Space Museum, the Smithsonian Institution, with uh, Dr. John Grant. Um, so welcome to our show, Almost Rocket Science, Dr. Grant. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. And thank you for giving us this wonderful gallery we're in today to uh, see some of the wonderful artifacts and even some of the products you work on. I know the high rise is behind you. So, yeah, I'm hoping that people will come and see our new Mars corner. It's got a lot of great information and a lot of great data shown here. Yeah, it is, you know, um, never being in this wing before, I'm really excited to be here and um, because, one, we have all these wonderful artifacts outside that draw people in, but now you get to share what's going on now because, you know, human space flight is kind of taking a little bit of a backseat and the real science is actually going on in places like where you're working, so we're thankful to have you. Well, I think it's just going on at a pace right now that if you wait six months, things change so much, it's great to get an update. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So now you're a planetary scientist. What exactly does that involve? Uh, as a planetary scientist, I spend a lot of time looking at the surfaces of the other planets to try to understand how they form. Mm -hmm. uh, are they a surface that's been created and shaped mostly by the wind? Has running water played a role? And specifically, I spend a lot of time looking at the surface of Mars trying to understand whether conditions on the surface of the planet may have actually been habitable, probably in the early history of the planet and understand whether there could have been abodes there for life. Cool. Now you're dealing mostly with Mars, but what, it, now there's other science going on with other planets as well, correct? Right, so I spend also a fair amount of time looking at the surface of the moon, trying to understand uh, how the different kinds of materials, the lavas and the craters interacted to produce the surface that we see there when we look out at the full moon here in the next day or two. Um, so planetary geology is trying to understand the geology of another planet as compared to the Earth. And one of the reasons we do look at these other planets is because they tell us something about the Earth. For example, the Moon and Mars and Mercury record a history of the solar system that's been erased on the Earth. It records the very early time of the solar system. So we can kind of look back in time and see what was happening then. So by studying other planets, we actually learn more about our own home planet. Exactly. That's really cool. Um, what are some of the challenges in studying a planet that Right now, you and I can't just take a, a quick flight over and visit. Well, <clears throat> one advantage we have is, uh, at Mars at least, because the atmosphere is very thin relative to the Earth. The high-rise camera, for example, uh, has a telescope that can look down through this thin atmosphere and image things that are very small on the surface of the planet. And because the, the planet is rotating underneath the, cam uh, uh, the spacecraft as it goes around, uh, given enough time, we can image any spot that we want to. So we can go back and look exactly at this place or that place if we want to. Um, whereas that's difficult to do on the Earth because we've got a thicker atmosphere and there's clouds. And so a lot of times it's hard to get back to that exact location. Having said that, uh, once you're down on the surface, like with the Mars Exploration rovers, uh, those have been trundling along the surface. Opportunity is still going for well over seven years now. And while we've gone something like 25 or, or almost 30 miles on the surface with opportunity, you can imagine that if you had been on the surface of the Earth for seven years, you would have covered a lot more than 30 miles. Mm -hmm. So, And you could have picked up more rocks and you could have done more things. So it's a little bit cumbersome to do it with a robot because we're limited in the speed in which we can do things and the tools that we have to do the analysis. But it's still pretty exciting to get data that a camera can't provide. Oh, it's, it's spectacular. I mean... Um, every day that we look at the images coming down from the rovers, it's a new perspective on a planet that nobody's ever seen before. So it's, it's really quite exciting. Mm. Maybe, um, why don't you tell us what maybe your most exciting project or discovery you've worked on with, or you've been involved with? Um, they're all different, so it's hard to say that one's more exciting than another. Um, with the high-rise camera, one of the things that I'm very interested in is the role of water in shaping ancient Mars and we've seen what we think are ancient dry lake beds on the surface of Mars, and to me that was an incredibly exciting discovery. With the Mars Exploration Rovers, it's this idea that the surface that we've been roving on has seen water contribute to the shaping of the landscape, uh, and the possibility that, it, at least in the Meridiani Planum area where Opportunity is roving, that water may have actually existed, albeit for not very long periods of time and not very deep, but for short periods of time on the surface. Hmm. So why, why is it so important to understand that there's water on Mars? Because if ultimately we want to know something about the idea of life on another planet, and we think Mars is a good place to go and look for that, it's got a sedimentary rock record that's fairly accessible by planetary standards, so we can evaluate it. Um, Mars tells us something, and water tells us something 
about the conditions that may have been habitable, about the conditions that might have been right to support life. And so the building block that you get to life and understand whether there was life there or not starts with, was there water? How much water? How long was it there? Hmm. And now, have there been any records of any life being found there, even at the microbio level? No. So far, we really haven't sent what most people would consider to be a life detection mission to Mars. Um, the Mars Science Laboratory, which is going to launch on November 25th, uh, is geared to very look, look very specifically at habitability issues. We, we know that there was water there. Now let's go and look for things like carbon and other materials that tell us something about the capabilities of that ancient landscape, not only to support life, but record evidence that it might have been there. Having said that, Mars Science Laboratory is not a life detection mission. It's going after this habitability question. It's setting the stage for a future mission, hopefully sample return, that will allow us to really comprehensively understand whether or not there was life. Cool. Even as a, a, ge uh, well, a planetary scientist, and considering that we've seen scaling up of different Mars missions, it, are you using something similar to the scientific methods that are taught in schools? Exactly. What I described to you is this sort of develop a hypothesis, think about the ways that you can test that hypothesis, revise it as necessary, and ultimately build up the data that backs a conclusion that tells you something fundamental about the planet. So we started out with this look at water, we're building towards habitability, eventually we're going to get to the life question and understand whether or not there could have been life on Mars. Cool. Um, now, how about this one? Do you believe humans will reach and actually explore Mars within maybe 20 to 25 years? I think humans will get to Mars. I don't think they're going to get there in the next 20 years. Um, and the reason I say that isn't because I'm a pessimist. It's because the next big mission out there is considered to be sample return. We've spent a lot of time looking at the sur surface of Mars. We've spent some time uh, moving around on the surface. And we're starting to get to the point where we think we, we, we know where to go to bring back samples to really understand something new, perhaps even about life on Mars. If sample return was to fly, that process, which would take multiple missions to go there and collect the samples, and you have to get them back to the Earth, it would probably take about a 10-year period, and it would start in about 2018, the latter part of this decade. So right there, just sample return is probably the next 20 years. Hmm. And it, so it takes a long time to prepare those missions, plan them, and then actually get approval and funding? Yeah. Um, it takes a long time to develop the missions and, and build the spacecraft and the instruments. Um, and Mars only comes around about once every 26 months. So you can't just push a button and launch whenever you want. And so you have to time things to sort of take advantage of when Mars is relatively close to the Earth. That's happening here in the next couple of weeks, um, which is leading to the launch of the Mars Science Laboratory. But it, it staggers us and says that really only about every two years do you have an opportunity to, to go there. Okay. So given the, the reality of a sample return sometime in the near future, the next 20 years, how about what kind of challenges would humans face if they went to Mars? Um, you have a huge challenge of just kind of getting through the ride there and back. Uh, the spacecraft that we're launching, the robots, really don't care how long they're in space, but it takes months, seven months, nine months, to get from launch to landing on Mars. And once you're there, of course, you don't want to spend you know, a week and then turn around and spend that much time coming back. So I think a huge um, hurdle to get over is a way to cut down that time to get to Mars uh, and get back, not only for the sake of, of resources that it would take, you know, food and other kinds of things, but also being out in space, you're in kind of a harsh radiation environment. So there's a, uh, some hurdles that we need to get over uh, before I think we're ready to do uh, human spaceflight to Mars in a way that, that makes sense in terms of the amount of money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we always hear that uh, term that someone in our current maybe eighth grade level or fifth, you know, somewhere in that range, middle school, is going to be the first person to set foot on Mars. But as far well, as... they might be. I mean, middle yeah. school, you're talking, uh, you know... You're talking at the age where 30 years from now, they're, they're probably going to be hitting the prime of their career. So. so it could be. It could be. Nice. My fingers are crossed. <laughs> there you go. Are you hoping that maybe one of your own children can get there? <laughs> uh, I hope they can. I hope they can come back if they go. <laughs> I know. Right? Um, so maybe you could talk about what inspired or who inspired you possibly to get into this field of planetary science. Um, when I was growing up, it was about the time that the Viking missions to Mars landed and went into orbit. And 
Uh, I was also very interested in science fiction, and I read a book called The Martian Chronicles. And it was sort of the tie of seeing the images from Mars, understanding something about the surface for the sur first time through those images from Viking, and reading about this, this place that was very different in the science fiction mode uh, really got me intrigued. And so as I went to uh, uh, college and followed up with a geology degree, I found out there was this thing called planetary geology, and I got involved. Neat. Very cool. Um, maybe to that end, what kind of classes or subjects would you recommend somebody who's thinking about going into that kind of field? Maybe they're from eighth or high, eighth grade or high school. Um, planetary geology is a science, and so you need to have a very strong background in sciences, not just one, um, and you need to have a strong background in math. Uh, you do apply these tools every day in what you do, and one of the things that I hear from kids all the time is, well, why do I have to take this math class? I'm never going to use it again. And I trust me that if you go into this field, you'll do it. But because it's exploration, because it's the excitement of discovery, you'll actually want to do it. It's actually really fun, and you need those tools. So bite the bullet now, get the work done. It'll pay off in the long run. Um, so, yeah, we received a question on Twitter here from Rhett Rothberg. He says, how big, is a pro or how big of a problem is radiation exposure for future Mars astronauts and is it something we can overcome? Um, it is a problem, in part because the time that it would take, as I mentioned before, to get from the Earth to Mars is really pretty long. And we don't have the Earth's environment to shield us uh, out in outer space. So um, it is an issue. We're measuring it. Um, the missions that are going to Mars now will have uh, instruments on them to measure the radiation environment at the surface. Uh, can we get around it? I'm sure we can. Um, you know, there's different ways to do that. There's sort of the blunt force method of, of creating a barrier between you and space that's thick enough to get around it. Um, and then there's more perhaps technologically creative ways. So it is an issue, um, but I think we can probably get around it. But we'll need some more data is what you're saying right now. We just don't know exactly how much we're going to be exposed to for that long period of time? I think there's a pretty good idea. It, we're sort of in the confirmation stage now. Okay. And understanding that if we, you know, take step A, B, and C, is that going to be enough? So I, I think we're on the road to, to overcoming it, but, you know, that's all down the road a little mm -hmm. bit. So planetary science, in your case, even though you're focusing in on how did that planet form, um, what's going on there now, relating that back to Earth, how does that tie in with manned missions? Um, it sort of sets the stage for manned missions. Uh, it tells us something about the environment. It tells us something about what a human would face if they're standing on the surface of Mars today uh, in terms of dust blowing around and other sorts of things. So you need to know something, just like with the Apollo missions, we had precursor missions that characterized the surface of the moon before people went there. Mm -hmm. uh, we're kind of doing that for Mars now. Um, as far as like the Mars high-rise uh, images and everything, are those something that's available to students and the public now? Um, all of the data coming from these NASA missions is posted and available to anyone uh, on the internet. And just a simple search of the word high-rise will get you to the high-rise website. site. Um, there's very comparable uh, websites for the Mars exploration rovers, all the other instruments on all the other orbiters. So yes, we not only put that data out there, but encourage people to go and have a look and, mm -hmm. and you know, roll up their sleeves and dig in for themselves. So it's actually a real bit of citizen science going on. It's paid for with a taxpayer dollar, so it's, it's their data, and yeah. we want them to use it. How, about, how, how scary is that for you as a planetary scientist to know that your data is out there, and sometimes maybe you haven't had time to mull it over? and somebody else can look at it? Um, it's not scary at all. With, the, with you know, just the time that it takes to process an image sometimes means that for some instruments, the data doesn't come out quickly, as quickly as it does for, say, the Mars Exploration Rovers, where oftentimes that's literally out the day after an image is taken. Um, we've never been scooped. Um, mm -hmm. There's people that look at these images that have great ideas, that approach people and communicate. But the whole thing here is that we're involved in a, in a journey of discovery. And uh, people want to be involved in that. And, and I think that's a great thing. So as far as requesting images from High Rise, how do we go about doing that maybe? There is a website um, and a tool called High Wish. And again, if you type in a search saying High Rise and High Wish, uh, you will get this tool. And anybody can enter a suggestion for any place on the surface of Mars and that will go to the high-rise team, it will be prioritized, and while it may not happen next week or the month after, eventually 
uh, hopefully that image will be taken and come down to the ground so that you can look at it. So that alien craft in Google Mars, we can request? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, no alien crafts. With the citizen science, you're able to gain suggestions, able to look at uh, areas with more detail and get more eyes that maybe are fresher, possibly with a more innovative uh, The more view. eyes, the better, because it's an innovative view. It's just a different perspective. And so a lot of times when you look at things, uh, from a different vantage point or with a different idea in mind, you see things that are different. And it's, it's the uh, compilation of all those different viewpoints that leads to confidence in an interpretation. All right, so we ask all of our guests on Almost Rocket Science, since we are STEM-based, we want to know why is, or what is STEM to you and why is it so important? Um, STEM to me is the idea that uh, we need to get children involved in science and technology. We need to do it uh, early and often. And I think that it's very important the world around us is changing every day. Um, the, the capability to uh, immerse yourself and take advantage of what's out there, but also to make the next steps to, to decide what's going to be out there tomorrow uh, becomes very important. And I think STEM is something that is definitely along that road. So I, I think it's a great idea. Hmm, thank you and a well put answer. Um, so that's all we have for the show today. We'd really like to thank you for your time, and we wish you the best in your endeavors with uh, Mars Science Laboratory and Oppie still on the, the surface of Mars. Great. Thank you guys very much for coming by. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Yeah.